This video continues where the last one left off, covering the remainder of the mathematical portion of the division of the canon. Because these proofs are quite a bit simpler than the ones in the previous video, we can get through them more quickly without spending too much time on introduction. The duple interval is composed from the two largest epimorics, the hemiolic and the epitritic. This proposition appears in a few different versions in different sources. I'm going to go through two different versions of it here. The first one is a little more complex and hard to follow, but the second version is quite a bit more straightforward. Here's the first, more complex version of the proof. Let b plus c be a hemiolic of d plus e, and let d plus e be an epitritic of f. Let e be equal to f, and c equal to d plus e. This proposition asserts that b plus c is the duple of f. Since b plus c is a hemiolic of d plus e, and since c is equal to d plus e, it follows that b is one-third of b plus c, and thus b is half of d plus e. Since d plus e is an epitritic of f, and f is equal to e, it follows that d is a quarter of d plus e, and thus d is a third of f. Since d is a quarter of d plus e, and b is a half of d plus e, it follows that d is a half of b. b was one-third of b plus c, so d is a sixth of b plus c. d was a third of f, so b plus c is double f. That's rather a roundabout way of getting to the conclusion. The second version of the proof is much more straightforward. Let A be the hemiolic of B, and B the epitritic of C. I've used 6, 4, and 3 to illustrate this, but you can choose any three numbers that stand in this relationship. This proposition asserts that A will be the duple of C. Because A is a hemiolic of B, two A's are equal to three B's. Since B is an epitritic of C, 3 b's are equal to 4 c's. Since 3 b's equal 2 a's, and 3 b's also equal 4 c's, it follows that 2 a's equal 4 c's, and thus a is double c. Therefore, the duple interval is composed of the two largest epimorics, the hemiolic and the epitritic. No multiple ratio is composed of two epimoric ratios, except for the duple alone. This proposition is traditionally not numbered, and it is almost certainly a later addition to the text. It appears in only one textual tradition, and some aspects of the Greek wording strongly suggest a different author than the rest of the propositions. It's tempting to exclude it as not being a genuine part of the division. The problem is it's hard to draw any clear distinctions between genuine and spurious parts of the division. If we take the view that the division is a textual tradition to which many authors have contributed through the centuries, and that this status is far more important than the work of any particular author, then there is no reason to exclude this proof while admitting the rest. The apocryphal proposition is as true and worthy of consideration as the others, and covering it here gives us a welcome chance to limber up our mathematical minds. The proof is structured as a broad reduction to the absurd. We begin by assuming the contrary of what we want to prove. In the first few steps, we're going to attempt to construct a multiple interval other than the duple that is composed of two epimorics. The rest of the proof will show that this interval is an impossibility because assuming its existence leads to contradictions. Let there be a multiple interval a to c that is not duple. Because the duple interval is the smallest of the multiples, any multiple interval that is not duple must be greater than duple. Let there be a third number b that falls between a and c. Let a to b and b to c both be epimoric. A to B and B to C must also be unequal. If they were both equal and epimoric, they could not form a multiple interval when added together, as we learned in Proposition 2. 
For the sake of convenience, we'll say that a to b is the larger of the two intervals, although it's strictly irrelevant which interval is larger. Now, let there be three other numbers, d, e, and f. d to e will be hemiolic, e to f will be epitritic, and therefore d to f will be duple. Now we need to compare a to b and b to c to their counterparts on the right-hand side. Since the hemiolic interval is the largest possible epimoric, it is impossible that a to b or b to c are larger than d to e. It's also impossible that a to b and b to c are both equal to d to e, since we have already established that they are not equal to each other. Let's assume that a to b is equal to d to e, and b to c is equal to e to f. If this were the case, then a to c would have to be equal to d to f, which is duple. But we already know that a to c is not duple, so this case is also not possible. That leaves us with three possibilities. Case 1 is that a to b is equal to d to e, while b to c is smaller than e to f. Case 2 is that a to b is equal to e to f, while b to c is smaller than e to f. Case 3 is that a to b is smaller than e to f, and b to c is smaller than both of them. We don't need to ponder the three cases too closely, because they all have one thing in common. In all three cases, at least one of the intervals on the left-hand side is smaller than e to f. If that's true, then the sum of the left-hand intervals, a to c, will have to be smaller than the sum of the right-hand intervals, d to f. But we know that d to f is duple, and that a to c is greater than duple. So a to c must be both less than duple and greater than duple, which is impossible. Therefore, a to c cannot exist. Thus we've proven that there is no multiple interval other than the duple, that is composed of two epimorics added together. From a duple interval and a hemiolic, a triple interval occurs. Let A be double B, and let B be the hemiolic of C. In this case, I've illustrated this with the numbers 6, 3, and 2, but you could choose any three numbers that stand in this relation. The proposition asserts that A is the triple of C. Since a is double b, we can measure a with two b's. Since b is the hemiolic of c, we can measure b with c and half of c, or we can measure two b's with three c's. Two b's equal one a, and they also equal three c's. Thus one a equals three c's, and a is the triple of c. Therefore, a duple interval and hemiolic make a triple. If an epitritic interval is subtracted from a hemiolic interval, the remainder left is epidoic. Let A be the hemiolic of B, and let C be the epitritic of B. I've illustrated this with 9, 6, and 8, but you can pick any three numbers that stand in this relation. This proposition asserts that A will be the epidoic of C. Since a is the hemiolic of b, 8 a's are equal to 12 b's. Since c is the epitritic of b, 9 c's are equal to 12 b's. If 12 b's equal 8 a's, and 12 b's also equal 9 c's, then 9 c's are equal to 8 a's. Therefore, a is equal to c plus an eighth of c, which means a is the epidoic of c. 6 epidoic intervals are greater than 1 duple interval. This proposition is simple, but we're going to spend a long time talking about it. It asserts that if we combine 6 epidoic or 9 to 8 intervals, we get a compound interval that is larger than the duple. We can easily check this using arithmetic. We discussed earlier in this series an arithmetic shortcut for adding two ratios together. We multiply their antecedents and then their consequence. If I do this adding one ratio to itself, for example, 9 to 8 plus 9 to 8, the result is 9 squared to 8 squared. In other words, to add two 9 to 8 ratios together, we square both terms. 
9 squared is 81, and 8 squared is 64. So the sum of two 9 to 8 intervals is 81 to 64. If I add three 9 to 8 ratios together, I can do this by multiplying all three antecedents together, and then multiplying all three consequents together. In other words, 9 times 9 times 9 to 8 times 8 times 8, or 9 cubed to 8 cubed. So to add three of the same ratio together, I cube both terms. You might be seeing a pattern here. If I want to add the same ratio together n times, I can do this by raising each term of the ratio to the nth power. So if I want to add the 9 to 8 ratio together 6 times, I can simply calculate 9 to the 6th to 8 to the 6th. This is a pair of large numbers, but the calculation is simple. 531,441 to 262,144. The double of 262,144 is 524,288 which is smaller than 531,441. So the ratio 9 to the 6th to 8 to the 6th is greater than a duple ratio. This is enough to satisfy us that the proposition is true, and I could stop right here. But this proposition touches on some additional points that are worth investigating. If your brain is already full, you can stop now and come back to this material later. But if you're willing to press on, we're going to cover some things that are useful to know when doing harmonic calculations. The tactic we used earlier, that of raising 9 to 8 to the 6th power, is not quite the same as the approach taken in the division. We have to remember that while the Greeks had a highly developed geometry, their arithmetic was still fairly simplistic. As we discussed earlier in this series, their concept of number was quite a bit more concrete than ours is. The reason we call powers of two squares and powers of three cubes is that the Greeks literally thought in these terms. The square of a number is the area of the square built on a line with that number's length. So the square on a line three units long has an area of nine. Likewise, the cube of a number is the volume of the cube whose faces have the area of the number's square, and whose edges have the length of that number. So a cube on a line 3 units long, whose faces are 9 units in area, has a volume of 27. To conceive of higher powers than this would involve thinking in higher dimensions, which the ancient Greeks obviously did not do. So they did not have a generalized notation of or concept for higher powers than 3. They would simply talk about multiplying 9 with itself 6 times without gathering these successive multiplications into a single concept. That's one reason the division doesn't do what I did above. Another is that the author isn't just interested in the extremes of 6 9 to 8 ratios added together. He also wants to know each of the means. In other words, the problem is to find the seven lowest numbers such that each term stands to the next in a ratio of 9 to 8. Luckily, there's an algorithm in Euclid's Elements that does exactly what we need. You can find it in Book 8, Proposition 2. To find as many numbers as are prescribed in continued proportion, and the least that are in a given ratio. For six ratios added together, this algorithm gives us a series of seven terms in continued proportion. The total interval will be the ratio between the first and last terms in the series. Let's demonstrate the algorithm abstractly first. My presentation here is mathematically equivalent to the version in Euclid's Elements, but it is hopefully clearer and easier to generalize. First, decide how many terms your series will contain. If I want to add an interval together six times, I need seven numbers. Remember, the interval is the relationship between two adjacent numbers. In a series of seven numbers, there are six adjacent pairs. Now I want to construct a table. The table is going to have seven rows, one row for each term in my series. And it will have six columns, one column for each ratio. Now I need to fill my table up. Let's say a to b is the ratio I want to add together six times. The first row of my table will include all b's. The second row will include five b's and one a. 
The third row will include four Bs and two As. I continue the pattern with each row, taking away one B and adding one A. Finally, the last row is all As. If I multiply across each row, I get the seven terms in my series. The dimensions of your table will vary depending on how many times you want to add together the A to B ratio. For example, if you want to add A to B together four times, you'll have four columns and five rows. But this diagonal pattern will always be the same. The first row is all Bs, and each subsequent row takes away one B and adds one A, until the final row is all As. Multiplying across the rows gets you the terms in your series in order. Now let's multiply this out concretely. I want to take the 9 to 8 ratio and add it together 6 times. So A equals 9 and B equals 8. My table will be 7 rows and 6 columns. The first row will be all 8s. Then each subsequent row takes away 1 8 and adds 1 9 until I get to the 7th row which is all 9s. Let's multiply this out. My first term is 262,144. My last term is 531,441. You'll remember these numbers from earlier. The ratio between these two numbers is the ratio of 6 9 to 8 ratios added together. Now, by multiplying across the rows, I can find the remaining numbers in the series. Each number in the series stands to the previous term in an epidoic proportion, so each adjacent pair can be reduced to 9 to 8. And, for example, the first and third terms in the series will reduce to 81 to 64, the ratio of two epidoics added together, and so on. But to get all these numbers related together into a series where each pair of adjacent numbers stand in the same proportion, I need these six digit numbers beginning with 262,144 and ending with 531,441. These numbers are quite large. When we're looking for the lowest numbers in continued proportion, we'll find that the terms of the series balloon in size quite quickly as the number of terms increases. But it's possible, and in fact very simple, to prove these numbers are the lowest in the given proportion. We started with our given ratio in its lowest terms, 9 to 8. Because they are in lowest terms, these two numbers are relatively prime, which means they share no factors in common. The first number in our series is made up of all 8s multiplied together, and the last number is made up of all 9s multiplied together. Since 8 and 9 are relatively prime, their higher powers are also relatively prime. This is a proposition Euclid proves elsewhere in Elements Book 7, number 27. And if we have a series of numbers in continued proportion, and their extremes are relatively prime, then the series is in its lowest terms. This is proven in Elements Book 8, number 1. Then, since 262,144 and 531,441 are relatively prime, this series is the lowest set of seven numbers such that each pair of adjacent terms stand in a 9 to 8 ratio. Proposition 9 only tells us that six epidoic ratios added together happen not to make a duple ratio. But it's possible to prove four successively stronger versions of this proposition. By stronger versions, I mean versions of this proposition that make more general claims over a wider range of cases. For the first stronger claim, we can prove that no epidoic interval will measure any duple interval. That is, no number of 9 to 8 ratios, or ratios in the same proportion as 9 to 8, added together, will make a duple ratio. Before we get started, we need to establish one definition. For a smaller interval, b to c, to measure a larger one, a to c, we must be able to find a series of numbers in continued proportion, such that each pair of adjacent terms stand to each other in the ratio of b to c, and the extremes of the series stand to each other in the ratio of a to c. For example, we can say that the interval 2 to 1 measures the interval 8 to 1 three times. This means that there is a series of four numbers in continued proportion where the extremes stand in an 8 to 1 ratio, and each pair of adjacent terms stand in a 2 to 1 ratio. This series is 1, 2, 4, and 8. Now on to our proof. Let A to C be a duple interval, and let B to C be an epidoic interval. 
B to C then is smaller than A to C. I say that B to C does not measure A to C. If it does, then B is a mean between A and C. But we learned in Proposition 3 that no means will fall within any epimoric or duple interval, but A to C was duple, and therefore no means can fall within it. Therefore, B is not a mean, and therefore B to C does not measure A to C, and no epigdoic interval will measure any duple interval. Generalizing farther, we can say that no epimoric or duple interval is measured by any smaller interval. Let A to C be an epimoric or duple interval. I say that no interval will measure A to C. If one does, call it B to C. If B to C measures A to C, then B is a mean that falls between A and C. But as we learned in Proposition 3, no mean falls within an epimoric or duple interval, and A to C is epimoric or duple. Therefore, B does not exist. And therefore, no epimoric or duple interval is measured by any smaller interval. Now, let's prove an even stronger version of this proposition. The epigdoic and duple intervals are incommensurable. That is, not only does the epigdoic interval not measure the duple, as we already proved, but no third interval will measure both of them, and we cannot measure any number of duples with any number of epigdoics. First, let's define commensurability in this context. Two intervals, A to C and B to C, with B to C being the smaller one, are commensurable when some third interval, equal to or smaller than B to C, measures them. They don't necessarily measure each other, but they are still using the same smaller interval as a unit. For example, take the ratios 4 to 1 and 8 to 1. The 4 to 1 ratio is smaller than 8 to 1, and two 4 to 1 ratios stacked on top of each other make 16 to 1, which is much larger than 8 to 1. So 4 to 1 does not measure 8 to 1, but they are commensurable, because we can measure them both using the smaller 2 to 1 ratio. This is a little different than the notion of commensurability used in Euclid's Elements. There he talks about the commensurability of lines or of numbers. A number x is commensurable with a number y when there is some smaller number z that measures both of them. So 9 and 8 are commensurable because they are both measured by 1. Likewise, a line x is commensurable with a line y when there is some smaller line that measures both of them. So a line with length 9 is commensurable with a line with length 8, since both of them are measured by a line with a unit length. These numbers are relatively prime, which means that they share no factors in common, but they are still commensurable. In fact, all rational numbers are commensurable with each other. This is not the case with ratios, which use a much more restricted notion of commensurability. This is because we don't add ratios together with addition, but with multiplication or exponents. When I say that two ratios, a to c and b to c, are incommensurable, I'm saying that there is no pair of numbers x and y such that a to c to the power of x is equal to b to c to the power of y. In simpler terms, I'm saying I cannot stack both ratios side by side and ever achieve stacks of equal height. I'm also saying there's no third smaller ratio, d to c, that measures both ratios. In formal terms, there is no set of numbers, w, x, y, and z, such that d to c to the power of w equals b to c to the power of x, and d to c to the power of y equals a to c to the power of z. In simpler terms, d to c may stack up to measure a to c, or it may stack up to measure b to c, but it can't measure both of them. The upshot of all this is that incommensurability of ratios is a much more common phenomenon than incommensurability of numbers. We should expect many ratios to be incommensurable with each other, even if they're made up of numbers that are commensurable. With that in mind, let's begin the proof. Let A to C be a duple interval, and B to C an epigdoic interval. I say that no interval will measure both A to C and B to C. If one does, let it be called D to C. D to C, then, will be equal to, or smaller than, B to C. 
If d to c equals b to c, then an epigdoic interval will measure a duple, which we proved earlier is impossible. Therefore, d to c is smaller than b to c and measures it. But we learned earlier that no epimoric interval is measured by any smaller interval, and b to c is an epimoric interval. Therefore, d to c does not exist, and therefore, the epigdoic and the duple are incommensurable. We can generalize this claim a little more. No epimoric or duple interval is commensurable with any other interval except for its compounds. I'm using the word compound here to mean intervals formed by adding together two or more of the original interval. In other words, a compound of 9 to 8 would be any ratio formed from its higher powers, such as 81 to 64, 9 squared to 8 squared, or 729 to 512, 9 cubed to 8 cubed. It's trivially true that the original ratio, 9 to 8, will measure each of these compounds, but I claim that no other ratios are commensurable with 9 to 8. Let b to c be an epimoric or duple interval. Let a to c be an interval larger than b to c, but not compounded from it. b to c then does not measure a to c. I say that a to c and b to c are incommensurable. If they are commensurable, let d to c be the interval that measures them. d to c then is smaller than b to c and measures it. Then d is a mean between b and c. But no means fall in proportion within an epimoric or duple interval, so no means fall in proportion between b and c. Therefore, d does not exist and therefore no epimoric or duple interval is commensurable with any other interval except for its compounds. I promise that these additional propositions are not just me wasting your time. They are necessary to tease out a very important point about the structure of musical space that I want to discuss in the videos covering the musical propositions. Everything we've discussed here is implicit in what we've learned already, but it's helpful to pull it out and make it explicit. This concludes our coverage of the first nine propositions, the portion of the treatise concerned with ratios in the abstract. In some ways, this part of the treatise could be seen as an extension of the portion of Euclid's elements dealing with arithmetic. We proved propositions here that Euclid himself didn't bother to prove, because their interest is musical, not mathematical. In the next few propositions, we're going to use the knowledge we have gained here to make statements about musical phenomena. The division of the canon is not explicitly divided into sections by its author, but later commentators have acknowledged a marked shift in subject matter between the ninth and tenth propositions. All of a sudden, we're no longer concerned with ratios in the abstract. Instead, we're considering how these ratios relate to musical intervals. The nature of this shift from mathematics to music is illustrative of the whole field of Pythagorean music theory, so it's worth studying in detail. And the best way we can study it is by considering the introduction to the division. Although the introduction comes first, I think we are better equipped to ask questions of it now that we have some idea of the author's mathematical apparatus. So the next video in this series will concern itself with the introduction. After that, we'll be ready to tackle the musical proofs, which are propositions 10 to 16. The next portion of the treatise concerns itself with the Greek musical scale so we'll have to take a detour in video 7 to discuss that. Video 8 will consider the enharmonic passage of the treatise, which shows us how to derive certain notes in the enharmonic version of the scale. We'll conclude with a ninth video showing the actual division of the canon. Thank you again for bearing with me through some difficult material. If you're not used to following mathematical proofs, this can be quite a slog to get through. But engaging with these propositions helps us get at some very foundational issues in the aesthetics of music that have been influential for centuries. Whether your interest is musical, mathematical, or historical, I hope this series is helping you to understand Greek music theory better. If you're enjoying this series, please like the videos, subscribe to my channel, and share them with your friends. I'm always glad to hear comments or questions, so you're welcome to open discussions in the comments to this video or to contact me by email. Thanks for watching.